Hi, Eric. Hey, how are you doing, Yunita? I am doing very well. How are you doing? I'm awesome. Thanks so much. Good to hear that you are doing awesome. Today, we are speaking about one of my greatest challenges in, in my career, teams. I have always struggled with teamwork because I was that goody two shoes that always completed all of the projects on my own, needing no help and preferring no help from anybody else because I know better. So I've never understood the reason for teams until I became a business owner myself and an employer myself. And then I understood that teams are an integral part of business because without teams, your people can't function. And without people, a business is worth very little other than finances. And since you are the expert on teams, please answer me this. Except for just people being important to business success, why are teams and teamwork specifically, why is it important? Yeah, so I love teams. And I love teams because I think that's the only way that we get big things done. You know, as much as the uh, the soloist can achieve great things, most of the times they're supported by an underlying team that is helping them put all the other things into place. I've learned um, that I mean, the hard way. I have yeah, learned I mean, that, if, yes. If you want to get to the moon, you know, you can be the guy who steps onto the moon, but there's a massive team that helps you get. And I think it's more important than ever because of the complexity that we are facing. And it's just impossible for one person to synthesize all of the information, all of the complexity, and to integrate that into a way that makes sense. You know, it's, it's just too much. Like you need a team that does that and that can bring the best of their thinking to you in order to execute on it. Um, on top of that, I think, you know, we're recording this in a time where there's craziness, a big crisis happening. And I mean, imagine if you, if you were out of the team, that supported you, that where you felt that they had your back and that you guys would get through this together. Like that component of it is just incredibly important. How do you, maybe we've been doing team building and, and teamwork wrong then all this time in, in my experience. So, so when I grew up and, and as I was studying and, and through the beginning of my career, teamwork was this painful thing and team building was this really, really awkward time that you had to spend a day together, you know, with people that you just know on, on one level and then you do random stuff and experience people's feeling. How have we been doing team building and teamwork wrong? Listen, my pet peeve is team building. <laughs> because when you say team building, like what is the first thing that comes to mind? It's exactly what you just described is that, weekend away and we play awkward little games mm -hmm. and people don't really like it and then we get back to the office on monday and everything nothing changed does. exactly um everything we do in the name of collaboration and innovation and leadership combines and, and comes to nothing so i think um i think what what happens is that we we do these team building activities once or twice a year and we frame it as, you know, we are going to go do a team build to go and fix it. And that's always been the big problem is that we wait for things to break down and then we go do the team building to fix it. And then we get back to the office on Monday and we're not seeing any results. And the reason why we're not seeing results is because what we're doing is lacking directness. So directness is a, a phrase that comes from Scott Young's book, Ultra Learning. And it's something we're all in, like very familiar with. All it says is that, if you want to be a better golfer, what's going to make you a better golfer? Reading a book on it or hitting a few balls? Like, see, hitting a few balls. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to be a better leader, what's going to make you a better leader? What leading. Is talk on leadership or leading? Yeah. yeah. We were just talking about this beforehand. Like, what makes you a good speaker is that you are in business doing business. And that informs your speaking. You know, like, you are in the game. Oh, but absolutely. what do we do with our teams? We take them away from the game. We take them away from business, away from meetings, which is really the playground for teams. We make them do things like spaghetti building. Like, you know, the spaghetti building tower. I don't know if you've seen it before. Yeah, I tried that with I my kids you. yesterday and they just, you know, I, I didn't give them proper instructions and so on. I just like, here's stuff, here's stuff. And <laughs> nothing happened. You know, surprise, surprise. <laughs> but if you, if you spend the weekend with your team building spaghetti powers and you come back to the office on Monday and you don't see any of those skills like the collaboration pulled through, 
is because you didn't actually train that skill. What you trained is to make them better at building spaghetti towers. And I'll be willing to take that bet at any time. You know, like we will take your team away again the next weekend and ask them to build a spaghetti tower and they'll be quicker and better at doing it because that's what they train, you know? So I think it, we need to make a few shifts in terms of team building, even more so now where we are mainly dealing with virtual teams. But shift number one is definitely that we need to stop seeing team building as um, these sort of games that we're playing and instead yeah. focus on the deep conversations. And number two is that we need to stop seeing team building as an activity that we slot into that has an end and a start date. And we need to start seeing it as a process that is underlying and ongoing all the time. It's not something that's separate from the team work that we are actually doing already. So if I am then to play devil's advocate, are you saying that uh, during all of my meetings with my team and during all of the work, I should go, hang on, pause, this is a learning moment. We are now team building <laughs> while we're in the boardroom and make it that awkward. <laughs> Wait, where's, where's the balance between taking teams away from the office and training their spaghetti tower building skills um, <laughs> and business as usual? Yeah, so I think obviously the reason we have a team is to deliver a specific result. Like we, we didn't create a team for the sake of having a good team, but it just so happens that having a good team will give you the result you need. True. So I think at this stage, what I see mostly is that we never spend time on the team. You know, so like, let me backtrack for a second. We have this amazing book that came out. It was called The e -Myth, And everyone knows the soundbite that came from it that says, you have to work on your business and not just in your business. Well, the same thing applies to your team. You have to work on your team and not just in your team. And working on the team then means, well, we have to take a moment at some point and say, well, how are we actually working together? This meeting that we just did, how did that actually go? And where I want teams to get to is what I call a SAM team, a self-augmenting team, which means the team is getting better continuously. And what that looks like for me is that perhaps once a quarter, we are actually taking some real time out and doing a bit of a deep dive into how the team's operating. But in between, we have a certain cadence that allows us to check in with each other. So it's not every meeting, that's for sure, like the team, but we have to make the time to actually work on the team. Um, my, my cadence that I work with when I work with teams is once a month, is that we, we go through the month, we do things as, as usual, we have a, a two hour session, we review like you know, how our meetings going, what are some of the challenges we are facing, we go away, we implement for the next month, we come back. And what happens, and this is why it's so important, is that over time, you actually end up creating a bit of a team operating system. So you're just slowly but surely tweaking all these small behavioral elements of the team. And over time, because the team is then committing to that, they actually end up getting better and stronger and faster. And, uh, and I think that's the way it's supposed to happen. It sounds all very nice and cozy and, and, and fluffy. Um, and what, what I do in my team is, is once a quarter we go away, not for structured team building, but we find a creative activity to do. And because we've been working remotely since the inception of the business years and years and years ago, um, that, that quarterly meeting is to talk not about work, but to check mm -hmm. in with each other, to have a, a visit with friends as you were. That is the purpose for that. But within that, am I being direct enough in, in the team building and is there enough value in it? And it, it, it's, still, it's still fluffy. Um, you know, with team building, there's always a report afterwards and feedback and we can check boxes and stuff. And, and I'm trying to picture myself, you with, with a, a team of, of a bunch of, of hardcore corporate operatives for two hours talking about fluff. Or is team building and, and leading a team less fluffy than we think well i would challenge the word fluff like what constitutes fluff soft because skills traditional soft skills are seen at the moment as fluffy uh in my experience mm. that it's the core of it's the hardest skill to practice and the hardest skill to implement mm. but from an outsider point of view and traditional point of view it's still fluffy if it's not mm. counting the numbers making the product selling it in packaging qa um uh, or Q, it's it's flat. It's non-core. It's soft skills. Yeah, and you know, obviously the biggest challenge for me regarding that is that it's not soft skills at all. Um, 
they are very important skills. And I think, so actually, I have, I have a few different thoughts about that, but perhaps the most important one is that a while ago, I saw someone saying we should rename soft skills to hard skills because they are the new hard skills. I agree. And I actually totally disagree with that. <laughs> Why? It's hard to implement. It's a hard skill. It's not soft at all. Why do you disagree? <laughs> because I think a soft skill is about things like empathy and how we lead, and how we connect to each other, and how we relate to each other. And softness is actually a very good place to come from when it comes to it. So for me, like I think soft skills are very appropriately named, and they should just stay the way they are. You know, we want to reframe things because it, it gives people a different way of interacting with it, and that's great. I'm a big fan of that. But I think soft skills can just stay soft skills. And in my experience over the past year or so is that people get that it's not, you know, it's not fluffy. Like when we're doing the team coaching stuff, like you're not talking about feelings, but you are talking about things that are difficult to talk about. Um, you are talking about the interpersonal relationships. You are talking about um, like where does trust break down? Like why are we not uh, looking out for each other? And I think, I think those things are really important to speak about. And I haven't come across an executive yet that hasn't engaged with that. And I think if you don't engage with that, you are going to find yourself in a, yeah, in a very bad position pretty soon because that's the way the world's going. People want to be connected. They want to feel like they have meaning in what they do. And you make yeah, a very... There was one more thing that I want to say. Mm. Uh, while you think about it, you make a very important point. Mm. So fluffy is when it's connected to feelings what you are doing um, when you work with specifically with teams and with coaching the executives that lead the teams is not the feeling side is less the fluffy side but very much still the soft side of human interaction um, but those based in in psychological concepts in communication concepts um, etc yeah yeah very much so um what i wanted to say was you know, yeah I've worked with some execs that are really, you know, like I've been in rooms where the people are so intelligent that I feel like outnumbered and outgunned in a big way. I've worked with executives like where you, you walk into the room and like there's almost no space because the, the ego is just so big. And what I've seen is time and time again, like if they want good team performance, they realize that they have to go a little deeper than what they were going for. Because that's always the problem is that we just want to go faster. But if you want to go faster, you need to go deeper and deeper at the relationship side. Um, it's everything that, you know, Patrick and Joni, for example, talks about. It's the trust, it's the accountability, it's creating commitment. Um, but there's so many other things that are a part of it. But I really think that um, my model that I use when I work with teams is that we have to ask two questions all the time. One question is, how am I showing up for the team? And then how are we showing up as a team? And what we always do is we get into the meeting and we just focus on the performance side of that, of that equation. And we never stop in, to consider, well, what does this team need to become or who does this team need to become to achieve the goals that it needs to achieve? Because we do that for ourselves quite naturally. You know, new year, new me. I sit down and I say, well, what do I need to learn? Or like, what are the things that I want to work on this year that's going to help me achieve my goal? So if you're doing that for yourself and you realize that you have to develop in order to achieve those goals, well, wouldn't you think that the same thing applies to your team? And it does. And I wanted to quickly mention just something related to what you said a bit earlier, mm. which is I think the fact that you take your team away and you're doing a relaxed, uh, like friends, what, what did you call it? Friends? Yeah, interacting as friends. No work talk, almost not work talk, but yeah. interacting as friends. I think that's super, super important. And when I, when I explain this in, um, in my presentations, I try and say that when we go from team building as an activity to team building as a process, it gives us the opportunity to do different kinds of things. So we have the deep direct work, which is what we do at the playground. So at meetings, while we are at the office, it's the, it's the deep conversations, the things that we don't want to discuss. But then we still go away for the team building weekend. But what if the team building weekend isn't about building skills, but about building relationships? Like, how would you then structure that differently? 
And I think that's exactly what you're doing. Like we're going away and I, I actually call it a bond building weekend. So it's not about, okay. it's not about skills, it's about bond. And uh, when team building is a process, we can work all of that. You said you have to go deep in order to go fast. Is that a new concept? Is that an old concept? Because traditionally, it's just go fast, just push performance um, at the cost of people. And that comes from, you know, the, the factory mindset of people. One of the industrial revolutions where it was all about uh, a team member, a person is merely a number, merely a, 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 a cog in the wheel. Um, nothing more than that. What is the benefit and how can leaders that, that grew up in the more traditional way of doing how can they start seeing that each team member is not just a cog that needs to follow his instructions, but can actually contribute a lot more rather than just hard skills? Um, mm. How do you start making that shift from, from seeing people as things to people as complex human beings with value to provide? Mm. You know, I, I, I often wonder if we can get people to make that shift. Um, and how easy it is. It feels like it, it requires sustained hammering at the idea for people to make that shift. And it does. you were saying that earlier that you know you can poke a business and it goes in a certain direction, but you can poke a human being and it doesn't quite do the same thing. And no. so I'm, uh, <laughs> I always think we should just find the people who are already moving in that direction and help them to be better at it. And then the people who are on the outside looking in, hopefully over time with enough uh, repetition, they start seeing that this is the way to function. But I also think, you know, as the world is, is changing, as people are expecting more from the employers, uh, they're expecting more meaning, they're expecting more of a commitment and an opportunity to develop themselves. People will just have to follow suit, you know, organizations will have to create those opportunities. For people. And coaching is a great example. For a very long time, coaching was sort of relegated to the, the upper echelons, you know, mm. only the ex, ex could get uh, coaching. Whereas now organizations are employing coaches internally, they're making them available to a much larger pool of employees. So I think people are coming around to the idea that we need to develop our people. They require that, they need it, they want it. Um, and the same is going to happen. I don't think it's happening for teams yet at that same level, but it's going to come um, because relationships are difficult. Uh, anyone who's in a relationship will know it's not an easy thing. Uh, there's actually a, a guy called David Sloan Wilson, uh, who's a, uh, evolution, a bio, biological evolutionist, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. He studies evolution, just put it like that. And he said that the signature adaptation of human beings is collaboration. And if you look at the way we collaborate, you wouldn't really think so. You know, I think we have plenty of examples of how we just atrocious at it. Um, we under-communicate, we, we fight, we don't get the work done, we don't really know what accountability is. So I think there's a lot to be done in just how we interact with each other in a team setup, especially when there's pressure and performance reviews and yeah. politics. And so I think that's why it's important. Mm. Who needs to take responsibility for teams? Because it sounds as you're saying, and, and in my experience, it starts from the top. It is a leader that comes in and says, we are now focusing on people and I am going to drill it into your head and this is my focus. Um, should all leaders suddenly understand uh, why people and why teams matter? Or is it a matter for the HR department? Um, hmm. Or is there an opportunity for, for those in the teams to say, well, hang on, I want different. You keep on saying, and I keep on seeing that, that the workplace is different and for you to to win in this new game of business you've got to be an excellent place to work you've got to appoint exceptional people and you've got to create an exceptional place for them to work but i know that this is it's almost just theory at the moment we see it work in businesses where we implement it right but it's not mainstream yet do those people in teams, the individual in te individuals in teams, do they have enough power? And how do they exert that power to say to leadership, I want different, I want more, I want a focus on teams? So Keith Ferrazzi has this thing that he said um, in one of his talks, that 
for a very long time, you could create a functional business, even if you had a dysfunctional team. But moving forward, that's not going to be good enough. I agree. You won't be able to do that. You need to have a functional team to have a functional business. So if you are a leader who is not embracing that sort of state of mind, um, you're going to find yourself out of business. You aren't going to be able to compete against the big guys who do. And, you know, the more focus we bring, all the reasons I mentioned earlier, you know, the complexity, the um, just the, the overwhelm of the world, if you don't have a team that can buffer that for you, I think you're going to really struggle moving forward. And if you then decide, well, teams are important to me and I want to bring the best, I want to help my team collectively rise to their, their top level performance, then you need to spend time on your team. And if you're spending time on your team, it means that you are creating the environment that has enough trust so that people can voice their opinions, so they can say what matters to them and what needs to be done. And the, the rooms that I've been in where the teams are like doing incredible things are the rooms where there's such a good level of trust that everyone has a voice and everyone can say what they want to say without fear of repercussion. And that, yeah. you know, I, I always think of, um, this is one military example where the guys were saying, when we get into a room, because everyone talks about hierarchy these days and, you know, what is the optimal hierarchy and who knows at this stage, like no one knows the answer to that question. But what they were saying is when we come into the meeting, hierarchy collapses. So we all have our say, we all equal, like no one is about the other. But then as soon as we step out, there's a hierarchy that forms mm -hmm. again. And it's important because when you're in war, you know, you need to be able to escalate things quickly enough and you need to know who to speak to for what and et cetera. And I quite like that idea as a visual that when we step into a room to meet, when as a team we are sitting together, hierarchy kind of falls away and everyone is equal in, in the voice that they have. So it's very much up to leaders to create that sort of environment for their team. I find also that it's that when that space is created, it's incredibly important for the members and the team to step outside of that hierarchy. Um, I remember one of my uh, team members took a while to, or two of my newest team members, they took a while to get used to our flatter way of working. So when it's discipline and reporting and making decisions, there is a different hierarchy. But when it's a meeting or a discussion or making decisions, that hierarchy collapses. And it's incredibly hard for someone that's never been used to it now to now suddenly stand up to the big boss to say they say in the way that mm. they want to. But I found if that culture of courage, if that culture of, of there won't be repercussions for in when you're allowed to, to voice your own opinion, what happens there is if, if that culture is created and um, it's consistent and people can see it working, then those that decide to have the confidence to give their input in that flat and collapse structure um, start becoming part of team and, and start becoming some of the most valuable voices in that team because they see things a different way uh, than those at the top of, of the hierarchy potentially may. So I do think it's a little bit of a two-way street. And when we create teams, it's it's not just about building teams, but maybe also about, and, and you are the expert on this, so, and I don't know what's in your program, you might have to tell me, um, or you will have to tell me, please. But is there a, a, a matter of self-mastery and personal development in there as well? Is it just about the team, or is it also about coaching and enabling those individual team members to step into the flattened structure? Hmm. Yeah, so if we come back to those, those two questions, the oh, yeah. one question is, how do we show up as a team? And so that's really everything to do with accountability, with trust, um, with uh, the commitment that we have to each other, to the bonds that we have. It's, it's how are we showing up as a unit? Um, and not, not necessarily just looking at the performance side of it, right? But us as a team. And then the second question is, how am I showing up for the team? And that really is the personal development component. But what's important for me is that, again, personal development can happen, happen in a vacuum that is really just about where do I want to go? Mm -hmm. But very often your team needs something from you. You know, you need to develop something for your team. And that's actually, you know, if anyone's listening to this, the, the best piece of advice I can give them to go and implement your team straight away. It's just to go and ask this question, which is, what do you need from me? And 
that question is, what do you need from me in order to be your best, in order to be able to do your work? Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, get the, get the stats to me on time. I mean, like, what do you need from me? Do I need to be a bit more patient, perhaps? Do I need to be a bit more understanding or empathetic? Uh, do I need to be a bit more, uh, I want to use the word precise, but the word before, punctual, you know, like, what do you need from me? And our leaders do that. Those are really hard questions, though. Um, mm. Especially if, if, you, if you haven't. I know it's supposed to be hard. So especially if you haven't <laughs> done it. Um, and once again, it's a two, two way street. To ask it is, is one hard bit. And to answer it honestly for team members who's never been subjected or, or immersed in that structure is also hard. Is there a way to make it less hard in the beginning? Is the way that you facilitate maybe through an anonymous questionnaire or something and then just work through a person who might be really toxic to the team and sometimes it's the leader, sometimes it's not, but sometimes that feedback isn't very helpful. It's, it's not positive criticism, but it's very much change who you are because you are toxic to the team. What do you do in those situations? So most important thing for me is that up front, we have to have a social contract. And, and I think that's what a lot of teams are lacking and why they don't get to do the hard things. And, you know, if you don't talk about the things that are like making you weak, that are creating an a unstable foundation for your team, guess what? Like over time, it just gets worse and it just rots. And at some point, there's a, a massive fallout. So much better you address it now and remove those things that make you weak and have a more solid foundation for your team. But it starts with having an upfront social contract that says, this is a team. And this team is all about high status together. We want to be the best team that we can be. And in order to do that, we as a team are committing to each other to be open, to be honest, to share feedback that will help us grow. And that we will never take this as a, a personal attack, but that we are seeing it as an opportunity to grow. And I think once we've set the tone and the context for the conversation that's about to happen, it kind of gives people permission to, um, like, no one wants to be cruel, you know, but we need to be honest. And if we, if we can't do that, then this whole exercise is quite futile. But what I have seen is that when I initially start this process with many teams, is that in those first sessions, there is hesitation, like, perfectly to your point. But it's okay. Like, it's just, what it means is that we're not quite feeling safe enough yet. There isn't enough trust yet. And I think that's a good thing to be aware of. And that as we go on, that trust builds more. And like, typically about two or three sessions in, no, maybe like three sessions in, mm -hmm. you really start seeing a shift. And you really start seeing people trusting each other. And they, they become comfortable with the process because that's, that's really a big part of what this is is if we build it up in our minds to be this big thing that people are going to give me feedback and, oh, what am I going to do with it? You know, of, of course it's going to be scary. But when it's just part of the process of us getting feedback, iterating, moving on, how amazing, you know? And it's easy to think of, oh, what are all the bad things that I'm going to hear? But, like, the good things that come out of these sessions are incredible. Like, people get so much validation of the things that they are doing right and um, what their teammates appreciate from them and where they see them shine and what their strengths are and those kind of things really build into a team. And that's why you're saying it's a, it should be a process. You should be working on your team as much as you are working in your team um, because of that process. And, and, and that's why a team building day is not enough because there's, there's not this underlying social contract. There's not this thing bigger than the team there's not this underlying trust and that takes time is there a point though where you've seen one of the teams that that you've helped um that they become so mature that you tell them cheers you don't need me anymore or they say to you well we don't need sessions anymore and it just becomes part of the inherent culture that just always continues and make it a, a great team or, or is it something that you when you sign up for it you never unsubscribe ever again you know so ultimately the idea is that you you should be able to get rid of me um that once you have this process you can run it by yourself but i i think it's always good just to have a facilitator around to have yeah. someone who is impartial and who can spot the patterns that you can't see because that's i mean it's it's 
an old saying, but you can't see the label from inside the bottle. And that's always going to be true. No matter how good you get this process, um, people from the outside will always see all the blind spots that mm -hmm. you can't see. And what's what's been really valuable for me being in those sessions is that you walk in and you watch a team and how they conduct a meeting. And within five minutes, you can start telling what the relationships are between different people in the room. And you can pull those things out when they don't feel comfortable enough to pull it out, you know. And and that really helps the team to move forward. So ultimately, I think what happens is like the, perhaps the cadence becomes a bit less. Like you don't have to see me every month, but there's still a value in, in having that kind of sort of feedback every now and then. And I think that's true just for, for human beings in general. You know, we should all actually have coaches um, in different areas of our lives who can give us the feedback that we need to grow. Because it's so easy to just fall into those blind spots and to not know where to go to next. And someone from the outside can actually see it so easily and like you'll kick yourself for not having done it earlier. Last thought that, that keeps on popping into my mind as we're speaking. We see all of these reports on, on social media and the internet. What makes places a great place to work? You know, indoor slides and cereal bars mm -hmm. and free lunches and campuses and free this and childcare, etc., which is affordable and part of the total reward package of many great corporates and you know small entrepreneurs small business can't afford that obviously are those symptoms and signs of a healthy team culture are those band-aids that wants to make it appear as if there's a healthy team culture um or is that just for show what will show people and at what point do you know that you do have a healthy team culture or the type of team um, that's that you promote for high performance. Hmm. You know, I think the environment that we operate in is really important. Um, we know that we shape our environments, and then our environment in turn shapes us. So I think it's important to have um, a, an environment that, that's conducive to performance and conducive to people building relationships. And I think in many ways, that's what that kind of an environment does. Is you know, perhaps if you have a foosball table like Perhaps it, it helps people bond, like bond a bit more you know, mm -hmm. during work time. But having said that, I don't think it's necessary for a good culture. I, I think some people do use it just to seem trendy and to like have put up with the latest fad and you know we are fun and we are whatever. Like it, it, it's not necessary, and I think in many cases it can be a distraction. Okay. It's much more important to rather just focus on the team first and make sure that. When people come to work, they feel like they belong and they feel like they have meaning because ultimately that's what we want. And, and we could go back to what I think Dan Pink said like years ago, it was people want autonomy, mastery of purpose. And if you can provide that, then I think the environment isn't that important, you know, like just make it a safe place for people to be in and to operate in. Eric, it has been super insightful to talk to you. Thank you for changing my mind on, on team you. building and teamwork. <laughs> Thank you for the big ups you gave me on, you know, I might be doing some of it right. Uh, it sounds like you're doing a lot right, don't worry. <laughs> but, but I am going to be more intentional. Um, and this is a promise I make publicly to my team. I am going to be more intentional on working on my team on a very focused and direct and strategic um, way rather than just the quarterly breakaways and think that that's enough. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, sure. We'll chat again soon. Bye, Eric. Bye-bye.